Yeah. <laughs> Give us a breakdown on what that means when they say that. Oh, yes. So equity is about, equity is a little complicated. It's, a, it's about giving people not the same, but what they need across the board. Um, and I think equity is often confused with equality, which is why I said it's a little complicated because people automatically assume it's just give us the same, give us equal. But no, it's a really about seeing problems across the board. For instance, in Washington, D.C., where wards downtown have longer life expectancies than those east of the river. It's not that they need the same amount of funding because we know down, sorry, downtown neighborhoods have more funding, more access to resources. It's about understanding that wards seven and eight need more. And I think we're still working through those problems. So when we talk about what it looks like to end the HIV epidemic, health equity is so important. Um, and that allocation of technology, technology being medication um, and resources, such as housing, addressing health disparities, um, which are problems, barriers that prevent people from accessing health care. They just continue to be problems in this modern day where they shouldn't be. All right, so what are the name of these shoes? Um, so I call these the lemon pepper steppers <laughs> because I feel like roach killer is too grotesque and lemon pepper is my favorite wing. And they just remind me of like leaving church and going to your favorite wing spot and, you know, giving the girls a good show. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like church plays an important role in your life. Yes. Tell me more about that. I grew up um, Baptist. Uh, my mom and all of her siblings, she has three siblings, are deeply religious, um, deeply involved in the church. And so Sunday services were routine. But, you know, our church kind of bordered on the more non-denominational side of Baptist uh, traditions. So while they were pretty strict on routines and, and things that were expected, um, like sticking to the schedule, et cetera, um, there was still a bit more freedom, especially in my high school years, to be a bit more rebellious with how I dress and showed up to service. Is this shoe an everyday shoe? Um, it could be. <laughs> I think this shoe is mostly for the club, which is why it looks like how it looks, because I've walked a lot of miles in these Louboutins. <laughs> they're not Louboutins. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think they're a very versatile shoe. Like I could wear them to work in my line of work in public health or um, to the club, to like the gay bars. I've worn these to like fancier gala events, um, all sorts of things, date nights, all types of things. What's the importance of making space? Ooh, I'm getting deep now. <laughs> um, I think making space for people allows them to show up authentically. And that's deeply important, and especially in today's society, because there's so many, or so few, I should say, opportunities for people to show up authentically, especially when you consider like social media or um, the job market, or even in some of our family and friend circles, you're not allowed to just be who you are. And so having space to be who you are is a gift. In your travels and your walk in these everyday lemon peppers, 
how have you made space for what you would consider your community? I think every year I take a, um, a trip back home. I'm from the Midwest where being queer is not as accepted. And so for me, this shoe symbolizes my transition and journey to becoming who I am as a very comfortable and confident and outspoken queer person. So this shoe to me signifies to other individuals that may not be as comfortable with who they are that I am space for them and that the miles that I've walked in these shoes could easily be replicated in their own journey, in their own way, but to getting to that other side. And if I can actually do that, it's a beautiful thing. As a queer person of color, how have folks made space for you? Um, I think um, folks on the media have done a great have done a great job of doing that. Um, seeing myself represented across a lot of different platforms, um, but in everyday life, um, I've been truly blessed to have. Uh, a great core group of friends that were immediately accepting of me as I began to come out to people. Um, my best friend, we're both from the same city. Um, I would just sneak to his house and take the bus over there even though my mom had no idea where I was. And we would just play dress up. We would just put on clothes um, and you know talk about our dreams and our aspirations, our lives, our goals. and the future, and this is, we're probably sophomore, juniors in high school. Um, and to me, that's the epitome of like, someone creating space for me, just allowing me the opportunity to get away from the strict traditions of church or the strict schedule of like my school or um, the judgments of family at that time to just be and just exist, to breathe. What would you say is the importance of family accepting the newer identities of their loved ones? Um, I think it's really, it's everything. I think ha knowing that you have that core group of individuals um, behind you gives you the confidence to take over the world. But fortunately enough for queer people, despite our hardships and the trials and tribulations we go through, we are a resilient uh, community and we have our chosen families. And so we're allowed to make our families um, in a tradition that has existed for tons of generations that dates into the ballroom scene and beyond, um, where we have structured our, our lives essentially to make up for the families that we didn't have, to create the homes that we weren't allowed to thrive in. And, and so we, where there's a will, there's a way. And we've figured out how to make that way. When it comes to the LGBTQIA community, what aspects of the movement do you think could be executed better? Hmm. I feel like I'm hitting you with some bops, like some good questions today. <laughs> These are some good questions. Um, I think there are opportunities for us as individual communities within the LGBTQ community as an umbrella to divide and conquer. For instance, um, individuals of trans experience um, have and are on the front lines of so many of our movements um, that have propelled and upheld gay men specifically, and we haven't been the best at returning the favor to them. So I think there's an opportunity today um, for trans, specifically trans women, to carve out their own spaces. And that I think hasn't historically been the best thing. We haven't done the best job at doing that. And I think 
allowing them the space to do that will in turn garner the support of their brothers, uh, i.e. us gay men. Um, and of course, resource allocation, um, particularly when you talk about the uh, HIV space, there's a lot of gatekeeping, uh, the old guard not giving up power and allowing for smooth transition. Um, there's a lot of quirks and nuances um, that we could be working through. <laughs> When you say gatekeeping, would you like to expound on that? Um, yeah, I think gatekeeping in the sense of like leaders of organizations specifically, I could name several here in the district that um, have been around for a long time that have been serving our community and they work almost like monarchies where um, a select few that may have had the opportunity to achieve higher educational pursuits or get credentials that some of us have not been able to historically are able to ascend the throne and take over leadership of those organizations where the rest of us are left to figure it out. And it's unfortunate because I've seen many times where individuals that have been doing this work and are well capable to do the work despite lack of educational credentials or whatever are passed over for various opportunities. What does the word community mean to you? Hmm. Community is collective experience i think we're able to share in the good times the good experiences um, but we also recognize the places where we've struggled and the room that we have to grow and overcome and that's what i love so much about being black um, I think we've done a great job. Of course, we're resilient. Of course, we're strong and powerful as a community, and we know this. Um, but there's just so such a rich history and culture. We even speak to each other um, sometimes through nonverbal cues. We're so advanced in that way. Um, that to me is community. It's more than just being family. It's it's experience. What does it take to survive a day in your shoes? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> I think it takes um, a good degree of confidence. Um, I think it takes a lot of smarts a lot of resourcefulness um, and the ability to let go, to breathe, and to exist in the now. <laughs> and I say all of those things as challenges that I struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're going to step into the lemon pepper steppers, you got to be able to <laughs> come with it or you'll get lost in the sauce as I have many times. How does it look for one to be lost in the sauce? <laughs> it looks like 2020, which I'm sure a lot of us have experienced being lost in the sauce, where we quite literally went through a cosmic shift. I like to say the veil came off of society and we saw um, reality, politics, institutions, jobs, families, friendships for what they really are a bunch of BS and I think for me during that time it was very difficult because like many other people I had to face the facts that it was time to get mental health resources that it was time to stop misusing substances that it was time to stop um, having as much casual sex as I was having and that coming of age for me meant that I had to do the work. And I hate when people say do the work because 
that is just such a good blanket statement for therapy, for mental health, when in actuality, doing the work is all about the processes of strengthening your mind and really confronting your fears, your demons, um, and standing in the face of all of that and being authentically who you are. And that's why it's so difficult for people to do the work. Is there a fear that comes with understanding yourself better? Yes, for sure. Because you might not like what you see. Oh, keep going. You're killing it. Just, just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> How has the sources you came across for mental health changed your life? Um, substantially. Um, I decided to pursue uh, therapy during the pandemic because I was having daily panic attacks. And at that time, I didn't understand what panic attacks were or why it was happening to me. So if you've had a panic attack, you know that it feels like you're going to die, quite literally. Um, it's like that uh, closet in Harry Potter where <laughs> it reveals to you your biggest fears. Um, everything that, but it's all happening in your mind. Everything that you fear. Um, for me, it was like repeatedly seeing myself like having a heart attack or a stroke. And it was bringing that to the forefront during this very scary cosmic time. And so I started going to therapy. Ironically, I met this hippie white lady that was a therapist that had a dog, like a, a support dog that could sense if you were having panic attacks. So every day her dog was jumping on me. <laughs> um, and she was really into crystals and spirituality and I was also working walking down that path at that point in time and she also happened to be from the same midwestern state as I am which was very just awe sort of hmm, what's the word I'm looking for just well it just all made sense at that time and through just being able to talk through a lot of my traumas and a lot of the things that I've been through um the challenges of showing up authentically as myself and confronting those things at that time, I think it made me a better person. It's hard, but it works. At that time that you were discovering you were having panic attacks, how did you build safety around yourself when you didn't understand what was happening to you? Um, <clears throat> I really had to evaluate the people that I allowed into my space, um, physical, mental, emotional. Um, I closed ranks and relied heavily on my core group of friends, a lot of which I met in college and my childhood best friend and my brother. Um, people that I really could trust. Um, and I had to let go of some people that I thought I could trust that I met since I had moved. Um, and that was scary. But I also got into saging and clear, clearing energy, cleansing energy, being very intentional about how I manage my energy. And surprisingly, I was supposed to be having a little kickback one time and I saged my house and some people I had suspected were not right for me had canceled showing up and that's the power of it. <laughs> it it's insane how, how that really works. Um, and yeah, I put it into action. I wasn't playing. <laughs> What advice would you give to someone having a panic attack at work? Um, I've learned through my process of uh, mental health and recovery that it's very helpful for me to think about anxiety and panic attacks very logically. Panic attacks, anxiety are uh, chemical responses in your body that originated back in uh, caveman times 
it's our natural instinctual response to danger. So as a caveman, you would sense a lion coming and anxiety would start pumping your adrenaline and getting your blood running and getting you prepared to fight the fight. And today our lions and tigers and bears look a lot different. So you might be having a panic attack at work because of a big presentation or a coworker that said something that you didn't like or somebody is messing with your energy. Um, my advice is to think of these things logically. They're not lions and tigers and bears. They are scary, your feelings are valid, but take time to process what's actually happening. Step back out of your emotions and breathe. Get away from the situation and reassure yourself that you're not in danger, that you're safe, that you're loved. Lean into your support system. There's been many days that I stepped away and called my best friend and that helped talk me down. Um, stepping out into nature, into the sunlight, and really connecting with those chemicals in my body to make them do what I need them to do. Because at the end of the day, I'm in control of my body. I'm in control of my mind. And you are too. What do you expect from an everyday shoe? I would say comfort, but that's a damn lie. <laughs> um, I like style. I like sophistication. I like conversation starters. Um, these are very good ones where people see them and I get a lot of compliments um, just because it's different. Like it's challenging social norms, it's challenging people's expectations of me um, and what they feel I, I should be dressed as or what I should be doing. And I think I like that in all of my shoes, like something that's different and um, allows me as an introvert to step outside of my shell and show act what's actually going on in my mind because it's a lot more funky and complicated than I think meets the eye. And that's what I like. <laughs> In your work and healthcare, what impact are you looking to make? I want to change the world. And I know that that sounds crazy, but um, there was once a time where I was going through a really dark, depressive time in my youth. This was like during high school. And for the life of me, I could not get out of this depressive episode. And I ended up going to a funeral um, for this lady that was at um, our new church. So we stepped out of that Baptist church and we in went to a real non-denominational church that was like a startup. And one of the ladies uh, had passed away that was in the church. And this church was based out of an apartment building. And she was just a nice old lady. I didn't know her, but she would give food and clothing to some of the poor people that were in her building. And that's when it dawned on me that my depressive episode was quite literally a response to these overwhelming thoughts of my sense of self and sense of purpose. I've known from early on that my purpose here on this earth is to change the world. I just didn't know what vehicle that that was supposed to happen in in and for a teenager that could be quite overwhelming for an adult that's quite overwhelming <laughs> um but her home going service it reassured me that you could do the tiniest thing to have impact on your community the people around you um, the people that are sharing those experiences with you such as giving food or selflessly giving of yourself and it snapped me out of that depressive episode um, and it changed my life in that moment. Her death ended up changing my life because I learned the valuable lesson of, of giving selflessly as a sense of purpose. And so through the work that I do, every job that I've taken has been community focused. It's been a direct response to a challenge. I currently work in public health for HIV. Um, 
and help navigate folks to community resources. And in that way, I believe that I'm making a difference. But I also know and believe that there's so more, so much more to go. And so what I want in my life through my work is to be able to continue to capitalize on this momentum and build on that purpose of changing the world. These are looking pretty good. <laughs> I'm a little better than what they were. They are a little beat up. <laughs> but that just means they have personality. Yeah. That's all. <clears throat> What's the difference between advocacy versus infrastructure? Advocacy is the fight. It's the vehicle in which something gets done. Some sort of change is brought upon. Um, infrastructure are all of the parts and pieces in which you can use to make something happen. So as an advocate, I can build, create, utilize infrastructure to bring about change. How have you been an advocate in your walk and how have you needed infrastructure? I've been an advocate in a lot of different capacities. I think I came into consciousness, I always say, um, <laughs> during um, the death, the murder of uh, Trayvon Martin. Um, that was very traumatizing for me at a young age and something that I'll never forget. Um, but it was also around that time that the movie Fruitville Station came out which was another powerful moment of like reckoning. And then after that, it just went like dominoes one after the other until it hit my hometown where we lost young Tamir Rice. And having that happen so close to home um, truly sent me on an advocacy path. And this was around the time that I was in college. I became the president of our Black Student Union at that time. And uh, we were already experiencing a lot of racist, problematic uh, attitudes on our campus. And so the time for action uh, was, was then and we had to get into the fight. Unfortunately, I wasn't prepared to confront my blackness and my queerness at the same time. And so my queerness got put on the back burner. But once I moved uh, out here, I was able to kind of embrace my queerness through HIV advocacy and taking control of my own personal health and um, mental, sexual, all of the healths. <laughs> um, and now having gone through those experiences, I think I'm a better person for it. Now in terms of utilizing infrastructure, infrastructure could come in the form of dollars. And as an advocate, you always need dollars to get things done. Um, but infrastructure could also be something as beautiful as a black cultural center for college students and that was something that we were fighting hard for on our campus at the time and through our efforts we were able to get that black cultural center which i like to say is one of my legacies that i've left in this world to this day because I, I follow their instagram and the students now are able to use that Black Cultural Center as infrastructure for all of their events and activities and things that they uh, need to have done. You want to shout out the school? Um, so I went to John Carroll, John Carroll University um, in University Heights, Ohio. So shout out to them. Um, in terms of HIV infrastructure, we could be here all day. <laughs> Um, HIV infrastructure is constantly so complicated, rooted in the 80s during the AIDS epidemic where the fight was literally just for the government to say AIDS, to, to proclaim that people are not just mysteriously dropping dead, that you know what's going on and that you have the power to make a difference about it. And then when they finally did say it, when they finally did acknowledge it, 
the fight then became how can we have an equitable distribution of these medications mm -hmm. then it became um still to this day an equitable distribution of the the medication and the resources the the funding that explain what that means the what the equitable equitable yeah <laughs> give us a breakdown on what that means when they say that oh yes so equity is about equity is a little complicated it's a it's about giving people not the same but what they need across the board um, and i think equity is often confused with equality which is why i said it's a little complicated because people automatically assume it's just give us the same give us equal but no it's really about seeing problems across the board for instance in washington dc where wards downtown <laughs> have longer life expectancies than those east of the river it's not that they need the same amount of funding because we know down sorry downtown neighborhoods have more funding more access to resources it's about understanding that wards seven and eight need more and i think we're still working through those problems so when we talk about what it looks like to end the hiv epidemic health equity is so important um and that allocation of technology, technology being medication um, and resources, such as housing, addressing health disparities, um, which are problems, barriers that prevent people from accessing health care, they just continue to be problems in this modern day where they shouldn't be. Nice. It's fucked up. It is. But as you were saying, Oh, that was it. <laughs> oh, like, I thought you were going to go past the equitable, like, okay, here's the next thing when it comes to the issues that you're running into with the HIV work and how things are being allocated or not allocated. You would wish that I, there would be a next part. And I think the way I was talking, I think I was, I started to lean into that. But as I was talking, I realized like, no, quite literally, this is where we are. There is no other progression. We are still having conferences like USCHA, um, the United States Conference on HIV and AIDS, um, where the conversations are still about health equity. Um, and yes, language has evolved. So there might not have been, you know, large conferences during the AIDS outbreak initially that centered health equity. And we're grateful to have those conversations now. But the fact that the catalyst for which these movements began is still the root in which we are still having the conversations today even in a black lives matter context even in a queer liberation a sexual liberation a women's liberation across the board the root of all of our problems is still the conversation it's crazy where would you have expected the world to be if things were actually taken seriously? Um, because I think there's, cer there's a certain amount of business playing into these decisions being made. Yes. Um, this is a complicated question for me because I think I tend to be a bit pessimistic in my my realism because i'm a capricorn i mean we're talking <laughs> from your point of view and you've experienced it so um pass away it's hard for me to see an alternative reality until we have conversations about addressing the system as a whole conversations and action yeah and talking about addressing the system is uh a part of me that for my peace of mind, I've chosen to kind of let go of um, because in my uh, Black Panther days, <laughs> um, I lost a lot of sleep and stress and worry and quite literally friends that were part of the movement that turned up dead in rivers and um, police 
tapping into uh, phones and technology and very scary things that sound like this is an episode of Criminal Minds, but were actually happening at that time. Um, because we're talking about 2016, which isn't even that far away. And this was when the Republican National Convention came to Ohio. And this was the time that Black Lives Matter and all this stuff was happening. And all of these were very real occurrences that have left very traumatic memories ingrained in my mind. And so I, I can't talk about, for my health, the addressing the system in the ways that I used to. But it's also hard for me to imagine a world in which these problems, such as the HIV epidemic, could magically be in a different space without it. Which is so sad to say. How does someone in your position deal with the reality of heartbreak? Um, I, this is so terrible, but I think I tend to become isolated and withdrawn and I think I, I tend to lean on um, my inner strength a lot to overcome heartbreak because I think that's what I'm used to doing and you know I can talk as an expert in a lot of different areas but the, the having the ability to manage my emotions and overcome challenges like heartbreak are things that are still a part of the work that I have to do so it's hard. <laughs> How does therapy play a part in what you've come to understand? Uh, so since uh, being in therapy, I've gotten a new therapist. I have a black gay male therapist now um, that reads me down <laughs> and gets me together. Um, we are working through um, mindfulness right now. And mindfulness is really about uh, retraining the mind to uh, have better responses, emotional responses um, to the challenges of life in the moment. And uh, so I think therapy is giving me those tools, the mindfulness techniques um, to be able to address things like heartbreak or sadness or irritation in the moment and to help me develop my voice uh, for a long time, as even as a community advocate. I was so rah-rah for everybody else, but getting played in my personal life. <laughs> and the pandemic was just one of those, like, this has to stop moments. I can't tolerate it anymore. And therapy's helping. Who advocates for the advocate? I think it's all fine and well to say that you can rely on your support systems, your friends, your family. But in reality, you have to be your strongest advocate at all times. And despite how you may feel in the moment as low, you could reach the lowest of the lows. If you don't stay in the fight for your life, then you're, you won't get anywhere and things will be much harder. In your body of work, what have you come to be most proud of? Um, I've been super proud about how um, this work has connected me to myself. Um, that's been a start. I've been able to, to utilize resources that I've gotten through my jobs to uh, work on myself, to work on my health care, to plug into the community, to meet friends, um, to, to love, to have love in my life. Um, because my work is people. It's, it's not just a nine to five. My work is community work. And I didn't go to a pride event until I got here. Um, and started doing HIV work. And I was probably 22, 23 at that time. So, you know, 
it's given me so much of myself which is such I hate that that's my answer in a way I guess but no I think it's it's a good thing it's a good thing to to have that because I know a lot of people work jobs where they don't have the opportunity to do anything like that so when it comes to events like pride what do you think could be done better when it comes to advocacy for these communities well dc is a very interesting place because um they have a pride they have a capital pride organization and then that organization is kind of the umbrella for a lot of different other pride organiz or events organizations um and so the question could be directed at capital pride i don't think capital pride is the problem for everything but capital pride has had its flaws um for instance not taking care of uh, black and trans prides respectively and so that's why they've branched off into their own things um but i think i think on one hand having all these prides is such a great opportunity for dc in itself but of course there's always room for development and that comes down to money that comes down to exposure that comes down to um the marketing for different events um and the the support and capacity that each of like the individual pride events have from this one umbrella organization wait rephrase that question i don't remember i asked it and i was like that's all you just sound like a great question <laughs> Um, I, I long story it. short, how can how can these organizations do a better job when it comes to pride? So, for example, it's nice that we have Juneteenth, but <laughs> Juneteenth doesn't belong to everybody that's black. We right. inherited that from Texas, and now we celebrate it more. Mm -hmm. But a lot of folks don't do their history. A lot of folks don't celebrate it correctly, and... A lot of folks don't actually have black pride that are black. Yeah. So when it comes to these organizations or these movements that there's this one month that's built around pride and gay pride and the LGBTQIA, <clears throat> I always think to myself, OK, once this event is done for the month of June, what else is being done in the right. fight itself? Because June is the celebration of the hard work, but... If the hard work isn't happening or the hard work isn't really being executed for the whole community, are we really taking pride in the quote unquote change? Right. Because it's very easy to fall in love with celebrating and stop aggressing, which is what we complain about as blacks. When we're like, hey, there's more rights we should still be fighting for. We can't just be happy with what we have so far, even yeah. if we're in America. Hmm. Um. I think it's exactly that. Like, um, I think a part of the work is for us in particular with pride it is celebration. And so if we could figure out ways to keep the celebration going 365, I think that's great. Cause I think part of the unique experience of being a member of the LGBTQ plus communities is that there is something innately joyful and colorful and bright and free-spirited um, about being in our communities. Uh, we are on the cutting edge of everything in a lot of ways, like Black people. Um, black people. <laughs> For real. Black people are always on the cutting edge of everything that is pop culture. And in a lot of ways, like us queer people, specifically queer people of color, black queer people, um, are on those same cutting edges of pop culture. And um, so a part of that is figuring out ways that we can allow that energy, that joy, that freedom to transcend from June into 
all the other months of the year. Um, I encourage people to go to balls, uh, go to um, go to other events that happen throughout the year. Um, at my organization, we do a calendar series of events throughout the year. Um, and there are a ton of organizations here in the district that are doing community work, HIV work, um, that uphold those same values and experiences that are offered in Pride all year round. And it's on you <laughs> to do the work to figure out who those are and where those things are happening. Um, but that's a great start and that doesn't cost you anything maybe the cost of the event but impulse dc a, a great black gay male organization um that was created to respond f to the hiv epidemic does events throughout the year they do fabulous events um there's the mayor's office of lgbtq affairs the dc center there's so many places and resources that people can access um and we have to be investing in them, not just monetary, but our time, our energy, our protection of those spaces. When it comes to queer folks of color in general conversation, what would you say the consistent fear is that you hear brought up? Um, I think right now the biggest issue is violence against trans people specifically and i think that that comes from fear of not understanding i think a lot of people in particularly from like the the black straight community um in a lot of ways they feel like i've already done this like a lot of black people were converted when Empire was on air <laughs> and that was their first taste of queerness, even though they they known the Uncle Johnny's have been there this entire time. But that was queerness and mainstream for a lot of our uncles and aunties. And they feel like they've been there. They've done that. They accept this gay shit. That's what it is. Um, so I think the trans experience is taking it another step further. And it's a step that they're not willing to to get behind so in conversation i hear a lot of problematic things um said about trans people because they feel that me as a cisgender gay male is a safe space for them to to disclose that that internalized bs and i i, I don't tolerate it i use those as teachable moments um especially now that um a part of the trans experience is now being non-binary, which is not identifying as either male or female. And um, th that <laughs> is like speaking a completely different language for a lot of uh, members of our community. So even gay, gay men, it's hard for them to get behind, especially older gay men, to get behind the trans experience, the non-binary experience, respecting the language, adapting to new language, new words. Um, we have to protect all of the members of our community and we should be using these moments not to antagonize each other, but to use them as teachable moments. And I'm hoping that that reverberates throughout the community and trickles down into some of these more extreme cases of violence um, because we ultimately have to put an end to that. In your opinion, now that you've said what you said, what do you think should have been done better in the community as a whole? Because what you've stated is probably the obvious observation from the person sitting next to you. Um, Take your time. In the, com in the LGBTQ community? Yeah. Because this isn't the first time you've thought of this. Yeah. This is another complicated thing in my mind. It's 
on one hand, it breaks my heart um, that there I do, I am a part of spaces in which my own community has problems with other parts of that community. Um, so on one hand, I'm very, you know, heartbroken and I wish that there had been more personal accountability, more willingness to learn, more willingness to, um, to step outside of your personal experience, to experience what somebody else might be going through and to jump in and support. On the other hand, I am very much a supporter of the, the ideology that <laughs> the hurt people are not the ones that should always have to do the work to make up for their shortcomings. And more specifically, as a gay man who has internalized, using myself as an example, a gay man that's spent a lifetime internalizing my own queerness and identity, now being expected to have all the answers for somebody else and their experience after just getting what I'm supposed to have gotten for myself. I can very much understand and empathize with that feeling of internalized transphobia or fear or stigma that surrounds other members of the community. It does not make it right. It does not make it acceptable. And that's not an apology for it. But I think there are systems and institutions in place that also have a hand in what's happening here. And if we don't call them out, then that does our community and ourselves a disservice. I think that was a great answer. Period. <laughs> <laughs> I had to find the words, child. I don't want the Dawes to be no. reading me online because no, I, I got you. I do love. Uh, I think transness is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's taken me a while to understand, to understand it, to get it, to um, to sympathize with their struggles, to embrace um, trans individuals as a part of the, my broader community as a gay man. Um, and I recognize that I have so much work to do for myself because I, I even say problematic things um, or don't always have the answers to things. I might not have the answer to this specific thing. I'm sure some advocate somewhere has will tell me off. Um, but what I do know is that the hurt that I experienced with feeling the, the need to have to push parts of my identity aside to take on the Black Lives Matter movement mirrors the same journey of having to push back my hurt and embrace something else when the reality is we're all going through the same things. How do you find peace while dealing with such internal conflict? You have to you have to come to terms with it. You won't find peace. You have to get through it. You have to get over it because that dissonance, I've seen it played out so many times on social media where black gay men specifically that have internalized homophobia, internalized all of this hatefulness. Um, there's a James Baldwin, Baldwin quote, he says, it took me many years of regurgitating the filth that I had been taught about myself before I was able to embrace the basically the beauty of who he is as a person. And I resonate with that so much. All that filth that you were taught, it just comes up in word vomit of, oh, black gay men shouldn't be allowed to have uh, children because they're oversexed and pedophiles. I literally saw that video like two days ago. And it's like, beloved, who and when were you hurt? <laughs> who were you hurt by that you feel the need to 
prevent or be a barrier to members of your own community thriving and being at peace in their own home. You are that disrupted. Your spirit is that filthy <laughs> that you would go on a public platform, Beyonce's internet, <laughs> and say some shit like that. And so that's why I say you will never be at peace until you do the work to to come to terms with who you actually are as a person. Um, it's just going to continue to be filth. Before we go, I think this will be a great last question. Have your shoes helped you get closer to your dreams? They have. I, um, I often think back to when I was like just a little boy staring out the car window, um, dreaming of a space and place in life where I would be able to just exist, to not have to shrink into myself or minimize myself um, for the people around me, that I could just breathe and just be and I think my shoes go hand in hand with my fashion sense, with goes hand in hand to my personal agency over my body, the decisions that I make every day to put on what I want to put on, to be surrounded by who I want to be surrounded with, to say what I want to say, to go where I need to go in these shoes. It all goes hand in hand with the dream that I once had of being this person who I am today. And though these dreams have evolved and I have many places and many other stories to tell, um, I'm just so happy to have made it this far. What's one piece of advice you would give to someone looking to be a part of the dream and the fight that you've made yourself a part of? Buckle up. Because if you're going to be a part of this dream, you have to do the work for yourself and you have to look at yourself because I'm no longer going to be surrounded by people that haven't done that work. And so my advice is to get the therapy, start your healing journey, whatever that may look like for you, because it's so much better on the other side. This is a day in my shoes.